Good morning, River Church. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. It's good to, good to see you today. New Year. Some of you were maybe out for January 1st, but now it's like it must be the 8th. So here we are together. So good to see you. Um, I want to encourage you to take your, your, your connection card uh, that you received when you, when you came in. If you didn't receive one, we have some more in the back. But, but take your connection card and, and fill it out. Um, this is the way that Pastor Billy uh, and I uh, know what's going on in your life. It's, it's a connection between you and us. And so fill that out and put that in the offering basket when we take up the offering later. If you're a first-time guest, uh, don't turn it in, but rather hold on to it. My wife Lydia and I would like to meet you at that, this back table after the service. And so hold on to that, and then come back there, and we'll take your card and, and, uh, and, and get to know you a little better. So if you're a first-time guest, uh, I'll see you at the end of the service. Um, this is a new year, as you know, and uh, I was encouraged last week. I, I talked about how I'm beginning a, uh, my, my, the, the Bible reading plan again. I started on, on January 1st, and so I'm eight days in or seven days in. I haven't read yet today. Uh, I, know some, I know that many of you are as well. Some of you sent me emails or, or just let me know that you're, uh, you're reading. If you want more information about that, I showed you the app last week, the version, the Bible app. Uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, but I want to tell you some other ways in which we can band together uh, as a community of faith in this new year. One of the ways is if you are a man, you can meet with other men uh, beginning this Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. right here. Uh, we encourage one another. We talk about the reading that we've been doing throughout the week. It's very informal and yet very encouraging, and we're out by about 8.45. So if you're a man, you can be here. Let me know ahead of time if you, if you can, but, but uh, it's okay to just show up as well, 8, 8 o'clock here on Wednesday. If you are a lady, we've got a Bible study or several Bible studies available to you. If you want, are looking for a group as a couple, then we have groups for you. If you would just put that on your connection card, that you want to get into a group, then, uh, then you'll get a contact and we will get you connected uh, in community with other, with other believers. Yeah. Perhaps it's as, it's, as, as a new year now begins to unfold, perhaps you've got some, uh, some burning desire to serve in a certain way. Maybe it's a unique way. And just this week, I heard from some people who had, who had the desire to, to jump into ministries that we already have uh, and get connected and serve. And, and I, I heard from some people, uh, two people, who had a new idea. Here's, here's a way in which I want to serve. We're not doing this, and we'd like to see this done. And so whatever, whatever those ideas are, uh, whatever God has put it on your heart. If you would put that on your connection card, turn it in, and then Pastor Billy and I will read through that and we'll contact you. I want to invite you now to stand, and maybe there's a new face, maybe there's a familiar face. Say hi to somebody around you. Let's do that now. If you're like me, you really love. If you're like me, you really love decorating for Christmas, and you really hope in January that the minions show up and take everything down. Because I hate taking the stuff down, right? Everybody likes to start the party, but finishing the party and cleaning up afterwards is tough. So I want to shout out to George and Josie and Billy and Elise, and there may have been some other people, uh, but they they clean this place up and throw this place down. Uh, and put away all of our Christmas stuff. And so thank you 
guys. It's behind the scenes kind of stuff. That, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Let me pray as we prepare to jump into God's Word. God, we've we've gathered today uh, together today um, with a sincere desire, at least internally. Um, maybe it's a private desire that we have, but a sincere desire to just get rid of all the fluff and, and get rid of all the pretend, and just really talk honestly and and hear hear um, authentically from you. Even if it's simple, um, if it's from you, if it's just authentically from you, then, then that's enough. So would you speak to us today through your word? Um, that this may be a, a, a valuable investment of time. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. We, we ask that you would move among us freely, openly. Pray that we wouldn't miss you. We wouldn't, we wouldn't leave here uh, having missed out on your power and your presence, Holy Spirit. You're welcome here today. Pray that you'd speak through me, God. Speak, speak prophetically in, in the sense that give me words that I don't even, that aren't mine, that are, that are from you. Um, we want to hear from you, God. That's, that's, that's the point. So speak to us today. Amen. I'm going to put up this first phrase. This is how today's passage starts. By, by the way, welcome. It's week 11 of, of this series, the, the study of Matthew, uh, the upside-down kingdom of heaven. But this next, this next uh, slide here that, uh, that we have, and we're just going to cue on that for a moment or just, just focus on this for a moment. This is, how today's, this is how today's teaching of Jesus' teaching, this is how it begins today. He says, this then is how you should pray. And I put this up before we ever look at the Lord's Prayer, which is obviously what we're going to look at today. Uh, but I put this up because this is really, it's really key. It's really vital that we look at this phrase before we ever study Jesus' teaching on how to pray. Um, in this Matthew passage, we don't have, uh, we don't have evidence of the disciples saying, Jesus teaches how to pray. Now, he just jumps right in. In the Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third book of the New Testament, in the Luke passage where we have the, 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 uh, the Lord's Prayer, it begins, or, 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 or his teaching of the Lord's Prayer is, is in response to the apostles saying, Jesus teaches how to pray. Um, but nonetheless, if it, was, if it was, I mean, certainly at some point they asked him, and certainly at some point in his life he taught them, but how he begins his teaching, I think, is important. And just by putting this phrase up, it doesn't answer the question of the why. I'm going to get to that. But he says, this, this then, this then is how you should pray. So, so when he says this then, he's referring to something. He's saying, it'd be like saying, therefore, or because of what I've just told you, you so, so uh, all the things that I teach, my, all the things that I teach my boys, and some of them now teach me, things that I used to teach them, but now they're better than me. Uh, but for instance, um, casting a fly rod. Have you ever seen a, a river runs through it? You, you know how to, you know that, that artistic way of casting to fish? All my boys cast well, but sometimes my, I have other friends or I'm a, I'm a guide, some, I guide some, so clients to get on the boat and, and they're just terrible casters. Like, 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 my, my grandmother casts better, and she's dead. Like, they're terrible casters, and they can't cast, like, the length of the rod. And, and I want to say, like, what you're doing there, don't ever do that again. Like, that, like, let's never do that again. And then I could say, this then is how you cast. And that would be chastising them. It, it, would, be, it would be demoralizing. It would be, um, it, 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 it's critiquing them in, in a negative fashion. But, but another time I might say, um, son, you're left-handed or you're left-eye dominant, and so we're going to shoot a shotgun. And in light of the fact that you're left-handed, this then is how you should shoot um, a shotgun. 
and you mount it this way, and you keep both eyes open. And I could give them some instructions, and I'm not a very good shot either, but, 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 but that would be a positive way of teaching my son how to shoot a shotgun. I'm not saying you're really bad at it. Don't ever do that again. Instead, in light of that, how bad you are, let me tell you. But, but instead, I'm saying in light of who you are, in light of this truth that you are left eye dominant, um, this then is how you're going to. And so that is, actually, that is actually what Jesus is doing here. If you remember in last week's passage, he did say, don't, don't pray. Um, he, he gave us some cautions. He said, don't pray uh, like out in the public, trying to, to uh, capture everyone's attention. Um, don't, don't, try to, don't try to make yourself look good. He did, he did caution us. He spoke a negative word. And sometimes we do that, right? I mean, we don't go out into a pray this line road and, and pray, but sometimes we'll be like, I'm, I've been praying for you. But it's not so much that we want them to know. We, we, we want them to know that we've been praying for them. And Jesus is saying, don't pray with the, with the, with the goal of, of, of bringing attention to yourself. He also warns about praying and babbling on and on mindlessly. Have you ever been there where you're trying to pray? And I'm just, I just really, I sincerely want to pray, but I'm, I'm falling asleep and, and I'm just, just gibberish is coming out, but not like tongues, just gibberish. And like I just, and, I, and, I, and you say, don't, don't pray mindlessly. Maybe you need to get some sleep instead of praying. Pray later when you're, when you're well rested. Maybe your problem isn't your lack of faithfulness in prayer, but maybe your problem is, is, is your, your lack of sleep. You're, you're, you're an undisciplined when it comes to, to resting. So Jesus gives us all those cautions. But what I want you to know is today as we jump into the Lord's Prayer, He's not saying this then, in light of all the ways in which you're really bad at praying, <clears throat> this then is how you ought to pray. That's not what He's saying. This then refers to something very specific, and it, I believe it to be profound. And so I want to, we're not even going to project it, I just want to read it to you, and then we're going to jump in. Matthew 6, after Jesus gives us all the warnings, don't be like the hypocrites, for they stand in the synagogues and the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Uh, you know, don't, don't instead go into your room and pray, and pray quietly, and don't be like the Gentiles, or they think that, that they, by babbling on many words, just these incantations, or these, and he's all that. But then, this is what he says. This is what this then refers to. He says, Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, I believe that to be profound because that is a tripping point for many of us when we decide not to pray. It's an ancient question. If God, is, if God already knows, why Pray. And I want you, what I want you to hear today is that Jesus, he is so counter to many of our religious beliefs, isn't he? Jesus' teachings, they so often go against the grain of, of our like typical spiritual teachings. Have you ever noticed that? Our religious teachings. And here today, he goes against that, the grain of our, our tendency to say, he already knows I'm just going to trust that he's going to work it out. I don't need to pray. Jesus, Jesus says, in light of that, this is precisely why you should pray. Yes, the Lord knows. Your Father in heaven knows what you need before you even open your mouth. In light of that, Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. He doesn't say, in light of that, there's no need to pray. He says, in light of that, let me give you a primer a little lesson on how to pray. So that's what, that's what Jesus does today. He gives us a little lesson on how to pray in light of the fact that we don't have to sweat it like, oh, God, you don't know. Let me, let me tell you. I've got to get you caught up. Or in light of, oh, God, I, you already know. Why pray? No, he says, here's how you pray in light of the fact that God knows. And so let's read. I'll read out loud, and you follow, follow along silently. Let's read Jesus' teaching in the one packet. Jesus says this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then that's where it ends. And then Jesus gives us this little lesson, which he'll unpack much more significantly later in the book of Matthew. He says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, so today, Jesus, primer, his, his, his lesson on how to pray. How appropriate this early in January that we get a lesson from Jesus because we could make January or we could make the, the entire year of 2023 a year of prayer for us, for your family, for you as an individual, for us as a church. And so let us hang on and lean into the teachings of Jesus. He deals with two matters, two issues. We're going to unpack it here in a minute, but two matters. He deals with, in this prayer, part A is God's glory. His name, his fame, his reputation. He says, hallowed be your name. And then he deals secondly, not because it's less important, but secondly, he deals with our need. That's the simple prayer model that Jesus offers us. In light of the fact, he says, that God already knows. He already knows what you need before you ever open your mouth. In light of that, he says, here's the model, and it's two simple parts, God's glory and our need. The two, the two focuses or the two directions. And that's an age-old focus. This is an age-old focus. You know, this prayer has been prayed for hundreds, for thousands of years by the church, corporately, collectively, and by good and faithful men and women, young and old. Think on how many times you have probably prayed this prayer yourself. And the age-old dual focus of our prayers, if we just want to make our prayers as simple as they can possibly be, the age-old dual focus of the Christian prayer is on God's glory. I'm going to switch out the word here now. God's ableness and my need. This dual focus, I'm going to switch the word again, but these are all roughly synonymous. God's abundance and my need. In fact, that is the nature of the gospel narrative. That is the nature of the gospel story. That is the nature of Jesus coming to earth. It is God's abundance, and humanity's need. <clears throat> when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, you used to hear this a little more, more often than you hear it now. Good old, old ladies and old men in the church, they would, they would say this. And, and now it's so, it's so quaint and yet so, so, such a precious memory. They would say, Oh, Randy, I'm the young, little young boy. I, I can hear my grandparents saying, Oh, Randy, like the, the God, the Lord, he, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If you grew up in a good old like, country Southern Baptist church, you probably heard that before. How many of you heard, heard older people? Or maybe you say it. I hope you do. Maybe you heard old people say that. Like, oh, the Lord, he owns a, the, the cattle on a thousand hills. Anybody? Has anybody but me? Anybody heard that? Very few of you. All right. You pagans, did you not grow up in church? Um, I'm just kidding. Um, old people used to say that. And, and it was, it was, it was um, the point was, the point is that God has everything. He, has, he, is, he is completely sufficient. He has an abundance. 
He can meet your need and have infinitely more left for the rest of us. And, and, and what you may or may not know is that is actually a psalm. Psalm 50, verse 10. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The point is this. God, He is sufficient. And His abundance is such that He is able to meet your need. In fact, He is more than able to accomplish more than I can even think or imagine. I, I remember um, precious Marianne Horn used to, used to quote to me, used to say to me, Ephesians, what is it? Ephesians 3, all the time. If you knew her, you probably remember. This may have been something she started doing more and more, this, this verse, more in the latter part of her life. But she would say this to me. She would say, uh, she would say the last part of it, that our God is able to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or even think. It's a fond memory I have of, of Marianne, but she was pointing to the same thing that those old people in my life were pointing to 40 years ago, the same thing that we're talking about today, and that is that God, He is sufficient. His abundance is such that we can rely on Him. Okay, so Jesus is saying that our jumping off point in our prayer is not our need. The jumping off, the starting point when we go into our prayer room tonight or when you kneel at your bed tonight or wherever you pray, the starting point, the jumping off point isn't your need, not because it's not important. The jumping off point is God's abundance. So three clauses, we're going to th three clauses of, of, of this prayer uh, regarding God's glory, and then we're going to look at three other statements of petition regarding our need. But first of all, these three clauses of prayer regarding God's glory and His sufficiency, and they are, we, we just read them. Jesus says we should, we should say, hallowed be your name. Well, what does that mean? We should say, your kingdom come. What does that mean? And your will be done. Well, you can go back and you can study the Greek and try to, try to figure out what all those three statements may have made. And I've done some of that this week. But you can also just go to different translations. The NIV, and the NASB, and the ESV. This may be gibberish to you. You can go to see what Eugene Peterson says in the message. My point is you can have three or four or five English translations and see how different, different groups have translated these. And, and, and you can really get a full breadth of understanding because we don't really use the word hallowed be your name. That's the NIV. But another way of saying it would be this. We start with, God, reveal who you are. May I and may everyone around me, may those under, that live under my roof, may those in my church, my congregation, may, would you reveal who you are? Have you, ever, have you ever started your prayer that way? Hallowed be your name. Like the mystery of who you are. May it, may, it, may it rest on me. May I know. I want to know you better. May your name be seen as holy. Like your name is holy, but, but may it be seen as holy. In my eyes, in the eyes of my family, in the eyes of my congregation, may we see in reality the truth of who you are in your glory, in your splendor. Hallowed be your name. And in that second phrase, may your kingdom come. It sounds very churchy. You may never use that phrase in your prayers except when you're praying the Lord's Prayer. But, but if we make it a little simpler, if we think what it might mean, it's another, it's another way of saying, um, Lord, would you come soon? Would you, would you return soon? Like, I love, I love this world, and, and, I, I, and I do. And I, I, I love my, my, my life, and I'm a happy guy. And I, I, I love engaging in arts and the culture. And i got a concert I'm going to next week, and I enjoy that. And we got about three more weeks of duck hunting season and then fishing season. I love my life. It's not that I don't love my life, but, 
but heaven's going to be way better than that, so, so come, Lord Jesus. There's an element of that. That's not completely what, I don't think that's completely what Jesus means when he says, may your kingdom come. But there's an element of that, looking forward to uh, eternity with no brokenness and no sin, no sickness, no death. There's an element of that in, in may your kingdom come. Then there's also an element of this. That is, set this world aright. In other words, all the brokenness, and all the oppression, and all the trauma, <clears throat> all the abuse that's going on in this, in this world, God, we know that you hate it. May your kingdom come in the sense that may, may, may heaven and earth meet. May, may, you, may you impose your kingdom on the kingdom of the world and may it be made right. God, would you push back the darkness? May your kingdom come. And then the third phrase, may your will be done. Eugene Peterson paraphrases that by saying, God, do what's best. You ever start your prayer like that? Rather than saying, God, I know what you need to do. Here's what it is. Rather saying, God, I trust. I trust you enough that I'm going to start with this. Would you do what's best? Because I don't really know what's best. I'm about to tell you what I, I'm going to petition you. I'm going to humbly ask you if you might do some things, some things that I think might be good. But the starting point is this. In humility, you know what's best. Would you do what's best? Even if it's counter to what I'm about to pray. Then go with that, God. Do what's best. In humility, I'm going to ask you for some specific things, and I hope you'll do those things. But more importantly, God, you know what's best. Would you do what's best? May your will be done. Now, all three of these petitions, hallowed be your name, reveal who you are. May, may your kingdom come, set this world aright, be introducing your upside down kingdom here on earth. And, your will be done. Do what's best. Those three petitions are those three um, clauses, however you want to refer to them. How will be your name? The kingdom come. Your will be done. They have a, a, a dual sense, like two tracks on which they are running. I'm going to use a big theological word that some of you know well and some of you don't, and that's fine too. There are two tracks. When we pray, may, may your kingdom come, when we pray, may you, uh, hallowed be your name, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. There, there are two tracks. There's one, the one is eschatological, thinking about eternity and in a future sense, and one is very personal, meaning in my life right now, in humility, I ask that you would do it in me. Start with me. I'll go first. Glorify your name in my life. Bring down your kingdom in my way of living. Do its best in my life. So, so there's, there's the, the, again, big word, eschatological, which means like, the, technically it means future things. The theology of future times or end times, but not in a crazy apocalyptic fashion. In, in, in future things, in, in future times, you, the, the ultimate destiny that you have God, for my soul and, and the ultimate destiny that you have, O oh Lord, for humankind, in that sense, in the future tense sense, um, would, your, would your name be glorified? Would your, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. But there's also in Jesus' teaching here an immediate sense to it that we sometimes lose when we pray this prayer. The immediate sense is, look, God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm humble and submitted to the degree that I don't just want you to do this in the world. I want you to do this in my life. 
If what I'm doing and what I want to do and what I think is best is not in keeping with, with what you know is best, let's go with what you know is best in my life. So there's a double application of these clauses. As it is in heaven and for eternity, so may it be in my personal life and immediately. And that's a stretch for us because there there are many times where I want to do my own thing right now But I'm praying these grand eschatological prayers. God, may your kingdom come. But but let me get my my agenda done as well. May your will be done. But but I got got some desires too. And and I'm going to take care of those privately, personally. I want to to do that immediately. Uh, Immediately, I want my way. but, But ultimately, may your kingdom come. One day, but not yet. And so you see the tension between the the future things and the immediate things. And Jesus is saying, no, they are one and the same. There's this tension throughout in in, in the life of the Christian. Well, has the kingdom of of, of heaven already come? Uh, Are we still uh, just waiting for it? And and, and we feel that tension as we study the book of Matthew. In in Matthew 3, we we studied about four... uh, Well, several months ago, but like week four, Jesus said this in in Matthew 3. He said, or actually, this is John the Baptist says this. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What is he saying? He's saying that when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, that the kingdom of heaven was ushered in at that point. So it's not, it's not that we're merely waiting and one day everything is going to be made right, but for now we can just live however we want. When Jesus came, John the Baptist warned us, things are different from here on out. The kingdom of heaven has now come near. It is, it is bowed low. It has moved into the neighborhood. And so we live in that tension of the kingdom of heaven is not yet here, and yet, in a sense, it already is. And so Jesus He highlights that tension when he said, don't just wait for one day when things are made right. Be about the making of things right now and in your own personal life. In fact, if this is not my immediate desire in my life as a believer, that that, that God's name would be glorified in my life today, at work, the play, that people would see that, that His name would be hallowed, would be glorified in my name. If, if it's not my, my desire that, that, that His name would be glorified in my life today and that, that His kingdom would come in my, in my experience today and, and that His will would be done, that He would do what's best in my... If that's not my immediate desire, it would be unusual to think that it would come to pass in my life years to come. That I would be a part of that, that kingdom living, that, that kingdom of heaven in the future if I'm not actively wanting it, praying for it, seeking it out today. It's that age-old cop-out, right? Like I, wanna, I, wanna, I just want to live like the devil today, but then I want, I want one day I want to be saved and, and go to heaven when I die. And Jesus is teaching us that there is the immediate and the eternal are way, way more related than we often think they are. And then he closes out this first half of the prayer by saying, on earth as it, if, as it is in heaven. It was, it was a few minutes ago when we read the prayer, but that's how he ended it. May your, or hallowed be your name, may your kingdom uh, come, may your will be done, he says, on earth as it is in heaven. And that, that rounds out or summarizes all three of these, these clauses. And again, he's saying, may there no longer be a chasm between God working out his will in, uh, in heaven and us living however we, we please on earth. May, may that chasm be closed in my life. Oh Lord. 
And then, the second half of the prayer, he deals with three petitions <clears throat> for disciples corporately needs. And these are prayers that we are, we, maybe you start with these, right? But these are prayers that are quite familiar to us. They're pretty basic. Jesus, he, 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 really, he, really, he really hits on something here, right? Like, okay, that I can relate to. The first half of the prayer, you're like, I don't really do that. But, but here, Jesus knows exactly what you're thinking. Is your need very important to God? And the answer is yes. Jesus, our, Jesus just told us in in light of the fact that God already knows what you need, pray. The fact that the petition part of this prayer is the, is the second part, that, that should not lead you to believe that Jesus thinks it's secondary or it's less than important. The starting point is the sufficiency of God. However, Jesus cares about your need. One of the reasons that Jesus is able to care about your need is because Jesus knows Need. Jesus knows what it's like to go without. Jesus knows what it's like to need. Because he entered into our existence as the God man. Therefore, he's able to relate. And you say, Do you know what it's like to be hungry, Jesus? He would say, Yeah. Do you know what it's like to wear to wear old, embarrassing clothes. And Jesus said, I could totally relate. I totally know what that's like. Jesus said, well, do you know what it's like to be picked upon or disliked or kicked out or left out or, or, or falsely accused? And Jesus said, yeah. When you petition your heavenly Father, all the emotions that, are, that go along with those petitions, Jesus said, I understand. I can relate. He knows what need feels like. Okay, so now it's real simple. I mean, you could probably preach the rest of this sermon. What does he say? He says, he says pray for your daily bread. God, give us our daily bread. I want to have a little fun with this, though. I want, to, I, want to, I want to give you three possible things that that means. I mean, the nuance. We know what it means to pray for our daily bread. But the nuance is interesting. If you wouldn't perhaps not have any reason to know this, but, but if you look at how it's worded in the Greek, it's a bit, uh, because it's a unique phrase that we don't really find in the Bible uh, and, and not much in Greek writing of that day, it's a bit uh, nebulous exactly what does this mean, give us our daily bread? I'm going to give you three possible options just based on historically how that phrase, how the Greek phrase was used. It possibly means daily as in for the day. I know. For the day. You remember, the old, remember in the Old Testament, the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness and manna would fall. The coriander seed, there's some kind of make it into bread. We don't know exactly what it is. For some reason, I always thought like, like, like s snow. As a kid who grew up in the valley and never saw it snow, but I would, I would take like the ice out of the freezer and make a snow cone. I always thought it looked like snow, but of course, probably didn't, probably didn't because you wouldn't, couldn't bake snow. But something fell from the sky, and every morning the Israelites would go out and they would collect it and they would make something. But those, those who rolled, like I probably would have rolled, they tried to collect twice as much. You know the story, right? They tried to collect twice as much as they need. They would, they would make the bread and they would store the rest and it would, it would rot in a, in a matter of hours. It was, became putrid and worms would grow in it that quickly. The point was, God in that, in that moment in time did not want them to, to collect two days worth. He just wanted to give them their daily need. And then tomorrow, I'll give you your daily need for tomorrow. And then the next day, I'll give you your daily need, your daily need for, that, for that day. Now, we like, that sounds cute, and we, and we would probably say, like, yeah, we all want that, we all pray for that, but listen, 
the, 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 the one main goal that I'm convinced that, that just about every human being has in life, and we struggle with this as well, and that is, that one main goal that we set up in life is to remove all risk in life and to set life up such that we have no need, no risk, no chink in the armor for the next 80, 90 years or however long you're, you're planning to live. That is what most of us set as a goal. Probably many of us in this room, most of us in this room, all of us in this room struggle with that. That is our goal. I want to be untouchable. I don't just want to have enough for today. I want to, I want to, I want to engineer my life so that I, I minimize the risk and I, I have all that I need. And I totally get that. I have that, that burning worldly desire in me as well. But in contrast to that, Jesus says, ask God for your, day, for your needs daily. So, so daily bread could mean that just enough for today it could also mean, and by the way, just, just let you know, I think it means all three of these. I think Jesus means all three. It could also mean daily bread. It could also mean uh, daily as in what's absolutely necessary. Like not too much, not too little, not excess, but just for survival. Just give me what I need just for survival. Like a simple daily bread. You know, I don't, I, don't need, I don't need steak. I'd rather not have bologna, but maybe like ground chuck. Just, just for survival, just, just enough, just what's necessary. Could mean that, probably an element of that in there. And then the third possible meaning, and again, I think it means all three of these, third possible meaning is this, daily as in for the coming day. In other words, food for tomorrow. Give me my daily bread. Like you can imagine, you can imagine a good, a good uh, uh, Jewish man, family praying at, at, the, at the end of the day. God, give us our day, give just for tomorrow. Like we're gonna go to, we're gonna go to sleep tonight, and we get up. Like would you just, would you just provide for us what we need for the coming day, food for tomorrow? And as I said, I think there is a measure of all three of those elements in Jesus' teaching on praying for it needs. The second thing that he says we should pray for, our daily bread, number two, forgiveness. Now he uses the word debts. I, you should do your own study. You should, you should look at, at, uh, the, at the, 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 uh, the, the Lord's Prayer in the, the book of Luke. Uh, maybe, maybe get some, some good resources and kind of see how he says it in Greek. But I'm just going to tell you, based on, on my study, that the word is synonymous with, with sins. Debts, sins, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, ask for forgiveness. Now, there is a tie. There is a tie between, and you can, you can, you can make of it what you will. I'm going to deal with it in great detail in, a, in the coming weeks when we get we get later into Matthew, but there is a tie, a, a, a connection, make of it what you will, between God bestowing forgiveness and your willingness to forgive others. I mean, it's just there. I'd like for it to not be there, but it is. I'm about to sneeze. Hold on. All right, so I, it'd be easier to preach uh, if that tie wasn't there, but, but it is. There's a connection in Jesus' teaching here between <clears throat> God's bestowing forgiveness on you and your willingness to forgive others. Does this mean I have to do something to earn God's forgiveness? And I, I just am compelled to say no. There's too much else in, in, in Jesus' teachings and in, in, in Paul's teaching regarding grace for us to say that, that God has set up any system such that we have to earn His favor, His forgiveness by doing something. But what at least is, 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 is being taught here is that there is, there is just the, this inevitable 
response or reaction that when you are a forgiven, a forgiven person, you're going to be a forgiving person. That when you are a forgiven person, you're going to be a forgiving person. And if you find it easy to not forgive others, you've got to check yourself. I mean, what's going on in your life spiritually? How odd is it to be totally forgiven and yet be unwilling to forgive anyone else? It just, it's an anomaly if that's how you live. So at least that's what Jesus means, and we're going to deal with that more in coming weeks. What Jesus is saying here, said another way, all God's gifts bring responsibility. So if God's gift of forgiveness is bestowed on you, then, then with that comes the responsibility to forgive others. If God gifts bestows on you um, an abundance, His generosity just is poured out on you with favor, then, then there is the responsibility to be a generous person yourself. If God bestows on you the removal of judgment, you, He no longer judges you based on your past, then, then, then what He, the responsibility that is put on you in that, as you receive that gift from the Lord, is that you are no longer a judgmental person as you view others. So with all of God, just think of whatever God has gifted you. <clears throat> All God's gifts bring with them responsibility that you would bestow on others, pass on the gifts which God has bestowed on you, including forgiveness. Forgive me, O Lord, as I forgive others. I think that's what it means. I've said more than I intended to. Third, thing that we are, <clears throat> that Jesus teaches us to pray, and this is the last one, is deliver me, O Lord, um, from, from testing. The English word here that's used in the NIV is temptation. Um, it's a good word. It's an appropriate translation of the word. Uh, I would choose the word testing. Um, I like the phrase God, protect me from future sin. We at least know from the book of James chapter 1, James wanted us to know that God does not tempt us. James 1.13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He <clears throat> tempt anyone. I think the point that James is making is in that passage is that, that God's, not, God's not tricky. God's not like dangling a carrot of sin in front of you that He might catch you in the act. Some parents are like that. I, I hope I'm mostly or never like that. But you shouldn't parent like that where you... you you try to set them up that you might then catch them. But if you've had a parent like that, you might think that God is like that. And God's not like that. That's what James is saying. He doesn't tempt you. He doesn't draw you in. He's not setting you up. So, so Jesus isn't saying that we should pray that the Lord wouldn't be tricky with us, that He'd be fair. What He's saying is, Lord, give me the strength in the testing. Deliver me in the testing. Make me faithful. Jesus is faithful and true. May that be in me. The stress here is on my vulnerability and my need for God's deliverance. And so Jesus says that's how we should round out or, or, or end our prayers. Lord, I, I am, and you would pray this tonight, you would pray this, you'd say, God, I am vulnerable I am prone to fail when the, the test, 
The temptation to sin comes around. I am, I am in need, O oh God, would you deliver me from sin? If you're a parent, you pray that for your children all the time. Now, Jesus is saying, pray that for yourself. Isn't that interesting? If you're parents, you know what I mean. It is so easy. It is so easy. It comes so naturally to pray that for your children when they drive off the driveway, when they leave the primitive, you know, like, oh God. Give them the strength. In, in moments of testing, give them the strength to do what is right. But 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 how often do you pray that for yourself? Again, the stress is on the disciples' vulnerability and the disciples' need for God's deliverance. All right, finally what I want to do is give you three, three statements very briefly of application. I'm not going to even unpack them. I'm just going to, you're going to pray, I hope. I hope you're going to go out of here and you're going to say, not that the sermon was great, but Jesus' teaching is great, and I want to do that. I want to pray, and, I'm going to, you know, and then I want you to do, I want you to get out, the Lord's Prayer tonight, and I want you to say, okay, what am I supposed to do? I'm actually in Jeremiah. Uh, let's see. Um, what I want to do, Matthew 6, that's where we were today. Um, okay, I'm supposed to pray. I'm supposed to pray, hallowed be your name. Like, may your name be glorified, may I, may you, may you, so you pray that, and I'm going to pray, may your kingdom come. I want you to go down. I want you to use this and pray it in your own words. Okay, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm expecting. That's what I'm hoping. That's what I'm praying that you will do tonight. And then again tomorrow. With that in mind, I'll give you three thoughts, and then we're going we're gonna to go to the table of communion. Three thoughts. One is this. I want to encourage you to pray what you were... Pray for what you are passionate for. I want you to pray for what you are passionate for. And for the moment, I want you to leave everything else out of your prayer. I didn't make that up. In fact, when I read it, I was like, is that right? Richard Foster, the book that I the book that I was encouraging you to read, the book that I had here last week, The Celebration of Discipline, he deals with spiritual disciplines. I read that uh, last week, and it was profound. And I'm, I, I'm not even going to put up the quote, but here's, what, here's the idea. Richard Foster said, perhaps if this whole prayer thing is really a, s- a spiritual, supernatural experience, and, and the Holy Spirit knows what you ought to pray for, He gives you the words to pray, and He in fact, He in fact, uh, prays through your groaning. The Holy Spirit is praying through your groaning, which you don't even know. Okay, if, if the Holy Spirit is bestowing upon us passion, Richard Foster, who's just a man, but he's a good man, a good teacher, he says, pray what you're passionate for and trust that what you're not passionate for, someone else is passionate for that thing. And the Lord will put it on their heart to pray for that thing, but you pray for what you are passionate for and maybe for now, don't even bother praying for what is not your heart is not stirred for. That freed me up to pray more passionately. At least it has for the last week. Second, second thought I have for you is this. Give space in your prayer time for quietness and listening. As you pray through the Lord's Prayer, perhaps you pray the first three clauses, you pray them one at a time, and then sit and wait and listen. And trust that the Lord is going to speak for you. In quietness, in listening, we call that, we have for the last, for for several uh, 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 millennia, as Christians, and even in the Old Testament day, we called that meditation. Don't let anyone co-opt that word. Don't let anyone tell you, oh, you shouldn't meditate. That's, 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 uh, middle, that's Eastern. or you, know, don't, you don't want to open yourself up to that stuff. Meditation has always been a part of the God of Israel, Jehovah God, the God of the New Testament. 
Meditation has always been a part of our worshiping the one true God. Be quiet before the Lord and wait with expectancy. Third and last encouragement I would give you is this. When, when the Apostle Paul invites us to pray without ceasing, that's way less mysterious than we make it. That means when you're at the, at the stoplight, pray. When you're dropping your kids off at school, pray. When you go on a run, pray. When you're sitting in the duck blind, pray. When you're on the golf course, pray. When you can't fall asleep, pray without ceasing. And you'll become a person of prayer. Amen. Let me pray for us now. Would you bow your heads? I celebrate, I celebrate the fact, O oh Lord, that you already know you already know what we need, and yet, and yet that is no reason to not pray. Friends, some of us in this room today, or, or, or many of us, are, are parents, and we would say, I, I know what my kid needs. And yet, what an honor when he, when she comes and asks. And that's what the Lord compels us to, to be like today. The Lord knows, and yet, he is honored when we come and ask. God, we celebrate your goodness today. God the Father, we, we celebrate your goodness in, in giving your Son for our forgiveness. Long, long ago, you determined that you would do that. You would send your son to pay the penalty that we rightly owe that we might receive the grace, the mercy of your forgiveness. We celebrate you today, God the Father. Jesus, God, we celebrate today your your humility in that you didn't you didn't cons consider the the safety and the esteem of heaven something to be grasped but you you humbly uh, came to earth and became a servant and you humbled yourself to the point of death out of obedience to God the Father and so now as a result of that Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Jesus, we celebrate your obedience to the will of the Father. We celebrate your humility. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we invite you to move among us today. If today is just a mental exercise, if today is just uh, a, uh, an exercise in learning, then... And that's a disappointment. But, but Holy Spirit, if you would move among us, this might be a, a supernatural occurrence that, that our thoughts, that our passions, uh, that there's a supernatural nature to their development. If, that, if you would do that, then we would, we would celebrate that. So Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we, we celebrate you today.